Grace and peace be unto each and every one of you from God our Father, from whom all blessings flow. Thank you for joining us for this Wednesday night Bible study where we resume our Bible study on the celebration of discipline. This has been a joy and it has been a journey. And how ironic tonight we are in the corporate discipline of worship. This being the first Wednesday of the month, typically we would be in worship. We would have a great preacher come and share the word of what God is saying to us in this season. Um, but this month we decided not to uh, do the prayer, praise, and preaching service, but we ironically, God has fixed it so that we will study the spiritual discipline of worship. And before we get into this lesson in this great book by Richard J. Foster, The Celebration of Discipline, let us pray. God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for the opportunity to praise and worship you. God, we look at it as an opportunity because we can never fully repay you for all that you've done. We can never fully express our gratitude for how great you are. But God, in this moment and in this season of our life, we pray, Lord God, that we take every opportunity and make the most out of every opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, in the midst of our worship and our praise, God, we pray for someone who's watching right now who is hurting in some way, shape, or form. Lord, we've lifted them up on the prayer line, but God, now we ask that you lift them up wherever they may be. God, we pray that we are blessed by this Bible study, that you teach us things about ourselves, you inform us and inspire us to be better Christians. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so now we are in the last section. There are three sections of uh, spiritual disciplines. There's the inward, the outward, and the corporate. And this spiritual discipline, which is a, uh, one of many people's favorite disciplines, is the discipline of worship. To worship, Richard Foster says, is to experience reality and a, a powerful encounter and experience with God. It is to know, to feel, and to experience the resurrected Christ, the powerful, the beautiful comfort of the Holy Spirit, and the love of God the Father. It is a breaking into the Shekinah light, the Shekinah of God, or better yet, being invaded by the Shekinah, or depending on where you're from, the Shekinah of, or Shekinah of God. Uh, God is actively seeking worshipers. God wants worshipers. Jesus declares that true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for such the Father seeks to worship him. Worship is the human response to the divine initiative. That's right. We don't worship people. We can celebrate people, but worship or to show worth, to place value upon and praise and honor is to God, and it is a response to God's action. In Genesis, God walked in the garden, seeking out Adam and Eve. In the crucifixion, Jesus drew men and women to himself. Scripture is replete with examples of God's efforts to initiate, restore, and maintain fellowship with his children. God is like the father of the prodigal who, upon seeing his son a long way off, rushed to welcome him home. Worship is our response to the, those initiations or those movements in which God seeks fellowship with us and cares for us, takes care of us, provides for us. And it is a means of acknowledging how great God is. It is kindled within us only when the spirit of God touches our human spirit. Forms and rituals do not produce worship. Routines do not necessarily produce worship, nor does the disuse of forms and rituals. We can use all the right techniques and methods. We can have the best possible liturgy or worship scripts. We have some of the greatest singers and eloquent speakers, but we have not worshiped the Lord until the spirit touches it. Let's say that again. We have not worshiped just because of man-made rituals. It is not worship until the spirit of God touches the human spirit. The words of the chorus, set my spirit free, that I may worship thee, reveals the basis of worship. Until God touches and frees our spirit, we are completely submitted to the move of God in that moment. We cannot enter this realm. That's right, worship is another place. It is a euphoric place where the mind, body, and soul can go and enter into in a powerful way. Singing, praying, praising all may lead to worship, but worship is more than any of these actions. Our spirit must be ignited by the divine fire. 
Worship is not limited to sing, singing, praying, and praising. There are other times, whether it be in devotion, uh, and whether it be in the preaching moment, even in the teaching moment, worship can take place. Worship is not based on volume or how loud you are, it's how impactful and intimate one's human spirit is in touch with the divine. As a result of this, these many truths that have been shared by the author and by myself, we need not be overly concerned with the question of the correct form of worship, the issue of high liturgy or low liturgy, um, vocal response or non-vocal response, that's not what this is about. Now, this form or that form is peripheral that, rather than central. We are encouraged in this perception when we realize that nowhere does the New Testament prescribe a particular form for worship. In fact, what we find is a freedom that is incredible for people with such deep roots in the synagogue liturgical system. They had the reality. When spirit touches spirit, the issue of forms is secondary. While we come from a tradition that is very vocal, um, verbal, vocal, and very much into movement. And a lot of that is deeply rooted in our roots. Uh, <clears throat> much of what we see in Christian worship today originated in Africa. And <clears throat> during the period of enlightenment, those who were colonists, I should say, uh, came to Africa and saw such of the vibrant movement taking place and borrowed some of those worship styles, but also when we do, do history on the black church in America and we hear about the ring shouts and how <clears throat> even in the midst of slavery, even in the midst of limitations, our people would go into the bush harbors and if they had nothing but drums and song, they would worship God that way. So for those who are fixed upon movement, clapping hands, it's, it's just in your DNA. That's a long way of saying, that's just in our roots and in our culture. But I encourage people to be open to other movements of God as well. Don't limit yourself to what you've been exposed to based on culture, but know that worship can be done in so many ways. To say that forms are secondary is not to say that they are irrelevant. As long as we are finite human beings, we must have forms of worship. We must have what the author calls wineskins that will embody our experience of worship. But the forms are not the worship. They only lead us into the worship. We are free in Christ to use whatever forms will enhance our worship. And if any form hinders us from experiencing the living Christ, too bad for that form. That means if it's so quiet that you just don't feel the presence of God, don't hinder your experience and encounter with God. Also, if it's too loud that you can't hear God for all of the shouting, if you can't hear God for all of the yelling, I should say, then the importance is not the form, but it's having an encounter with God. Who is the object of our worship? Jesus answers for all time the question of whom we are to worship. He says, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And that's in the gospel of Matthew, fourth chapter in the 10th verse. The one true God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs, the fathers of the faith, the God whom Jesus Christ revealed. God made clear his hatred for all idolatries by placing an incisive command at the start of the Decalogue. You shall have no other gods, that's the Ten Commandments, in case you guys wonder. You shall have no other gods before me, Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. Nor does idolatry consist only in bowing before visible objects of adoration. A.W. Tozer, the great theologian, says the essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. To think rightly about God is an important sense to have everything right. To think wrongly about God is in an important sense to have everything wrong. We desperately need to see who God is, to read about his self-disclosure to his ancient people, Israel, to meditate on his attributes, to gaze upon the revelation of his nature in Jesus Christ. When we see the Lord of hosts high and lifted up, ponder his infinite wisdom and knowledge, wonder at his unfathomable mercy and love, we cannot help but move into doxology. Doxology is giving God the glory. When we say, praise God from whom all blessings flow, praise him all creatures here below, praise him above the heavenly host, praise God, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. That is doxology. And to see who the Lord is brings us to confession. 
when Isaiah caught sight of the glory of God, he cried, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Pervasive sinfulness of human beings becomes evident when contrasted with the radiant holiness of God. Our fickleness becomes apparent once we see God's faithfulness. To understand his grace is to understand our guilt. We worship the Lord not only because of who he is, but also because of what he has done. Above all, the God of the Bible is the God who acts. His goodness, faithfulness, justice, mercy, all can be seen in his dealings with his people. His gracious actions are not only etched into ancient history, but are engraved into our personal histories. As the Apostle Paul says, the only reasonable response is worship. We praise God for who he is and thank him for what he has done. If the Lord is to be our Lord, worship must have priority in our lives. The first commandment of Jesus is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The divine priority is worship first, service second. Our lives are to be punctuated with praise, thanksgiving, and adoration unto God. Service flows out of worship. Service as a substitute for worship is idolatry. You must worship the Lord your God. Activity is the enemy of adoration. That means you can't, if you stay so busy so that you can't worship, that's not the right heart and the right spirit. You can't fully love God without at some point wanting to honor God and show God how much you love him. Service is important, but to do it as a substitute is incorrect theology. The primary function of the Levitical priest was to come near to me to minister to me. The Old Testament priesthood ministry to God was to precede all other work. That is no less true of the universal priesthood of the New Testament. One grave temptation we all face is to run around answering calls to service without ministering to the Lord himself. That means you can't be so busy with other people and other things that you forget about God. Today, God is calling his church back to worship. This can be seen in high church circles where there is a renewed interest in intimacy with God. It can be seen in low church circles where there is a renewed interest in liturgy. It can be seen everywhere in between these two. It is, as, it is as if God is saying, I want the hearts of my people back. And if we long to go where God is going and do what God is doing, we will move into deeper, more authentic worship. A striking feature of worship in the Bible is that people gathered in what we could only call a holy expectancy. They came together expecting a mighty move of God. They did not have a time limit on how short or how long they would be in service, but rather they came expecting God to do something. They believed that they would actually hear the call of Yahweh, the voice of God. When Moses went into the tabernacle, he knew he was entering the presence of God. The same was true of the early church. It was not surprising to them that the building in which they met would sometimes shake with the power of God. It had happened before in Acts chapter 2. When some dropped dead and others were raised from the dead by the word of the Lord, the people knew that God was in their midst. And when they came in there, they were on holy ground. As those early believers gathered, they were keenly aware that the veil had been ripped in two. And like Moses and Aaron, they were entering the holy of holies. No intermediaries were needed. They were coming into the awful, glorious, gracious presence of the living God. They gathered with anticipation, knowing that Christ was present among them and would teach them and touch them with his living power. How do we cultivate this holy expectancy? It begins in us as we enter into the Shekinah of the heart. While living out the demands of our day, we are filled with inward worship and adoration. We work and play and eat and sleep, yet we are listening, ever listening to our teaching. Writings of Frank LeBach are filled with this sense of living under the shadow of the Almighty God. He says, of all today's miracles, the greatest is this, to know that I find thee best when I work listening. Thank thee, too, that the habit of constant conversation grows easier each day. The constant conversation is with God. He says, I really do believe all thought can be conversations with God.
Brother Lawrence knew the same reality because he experienced the presence of God in the kitchen. He knew he would meet God in the mass or in the sanctuary as well. He writes, I cannot imagine how religious people can live satisfied without the practice of the presence of God. Those who have once tasted the Shekinah of God in daily experience of the power of the presence of God can never again live satisfied without the practice of the presence of God. Catching the vision from Brother Lawrence and Frank Labak, uh, Richard J. Foster dedicated one whole year to learning how to live with a perpetual openness to Jesus as his present teacher. He was determined to learn God's vocabulary. Is he addressing me through those singing birds or that sad face? He sought to allow God to move through every action. While his fingers were writing, his voice was speaking. He, his desire was to punctuate each minute with inward whisperings of adoration, praise, and thanksgiving. Foster said he often fell for hours, even days at a time, but each time he came back and tried again. That year did many things for him, but especially heightened his sense of expectancy in public worship. After all, he had graciously spoke, God had graciously spoken to Brother Foster dozens, in dozens of ways throughout the week. He would certainly speak to him here as well. In addition, he found it increasingly easier to distinguish God's voice from the blare of everyday life. Here, we can't stress this enough. The greatest way to learn when God is speaking and to have sensitivity to the Holy Spirit and what God is saying versus your own personal feelings is to be more intentional about spending time with God, listening for the voice of God, and worshiping God. As you draw an even closer relationship to God, as the saying goes, my sheep know my voice. And so if you want to know when God is answering your prayer, or, or if you want a better understanding of when God speaks to you through visions and dreams, worship is the way to go. That's right. And not doing it only on Sundays. Worship is not a one-day event. It is a lifestyle. You should not wait until Sunday morning to worship God, but make it a part of your everyday ritual. Find some time, some ways to worship God as much as you can. Worship must include an expectancy of God. That's right. I'm not saying you have to tell God, all right, God, after I finish praying, I need you to strike this down. Or after I finish praying, I need you to just magically make this song appear. But it is an expectancy of God to do something. And so when we come to God for true worship, there should be some expectancy, not a list, a catalog list of, all right, God, I'm going to preach real hard this Sunday. Or I'm going to teach real, real good this Sunday. I'm expecting three people to join the church. That's not how this works, but you ought to expect the move of God for the people and what the people need on that day in that hour. And God will move. The more and more you worship him, the more and more you'll experience God's power and God's movement. <clears throat> Here's a practical handle to put on this idea of intimacy with God and worshiping with God and expectancy of God and having a more powerful Sunday worship experience. Worship at home. What you do throughout the week can lead to an even more powerful experience on Sundays. So live throughout the week as an heir of the kingdom, listening for his voice, obeying his word. And since you have heard his voice throughout the week, you know that you will hear his voice as you gather for public worship. And then enter the service 10 minutes early. Lift your heart in adoration to the king of glory, not waiting for other people to join in with you or to watch you, but because you have a personal expectancy that you want to experience something for yourself and for the people. Contemplate God's majesty, glory, and tenderness as revealed in Jesus Christ. Picture the marvelous vision that Isaiah had of the Lord, high and lifted up, and they were singing, holy, holy, holy. Or think about the magnificent revelation that John had of Christ with eyes like a flame of fire and a voice like the sound of many waters. Invite the real presence to be manifest. Next, lift into the light of Christ, the pastor and other worship leaders. Picture the Shekinah of God's radiance surrounding them. Inwardly release them to speak the truth boldly in the power of the Lord. Not your agenda, but God's agenda. When people begin to enter the room, glance around until you see someone who needs your intercessory work. 
Perhaps their shoulders are drooped, they're saddened. Lift them into the glorious, refreshing light of his presence. Now, let me caution you, especially depending on where you worship at, there may be some rules about just going up to people. Uh, ask God how to move. There's a great, great possibility. God will ask for you to pray for them right there. This was without you going to them, asking what's wrong or what's going on. Now, God may empower you at some point after the service or in some way, shape or form to have a conversation with them. But I would encourage you to pray before you move. But as you witness people coming in who, who may be burdened, who are sad and who are going through, hold them as a special intention throughout the service. Another vital feature of the early Christian community was their sense of being gathered together in worship. First, they were gathered in the sense that they actually met as a group. And second, as they met, they were gathered into a unity of spirit that transcended their individualism. When you look for other people to pray for, when you look for other people to possibly minister to, that enhances the community and adds more to the unity of the spirit in which you all are worshiping God together. In contrast to the religions of the East, the Christian faith has strongly emphasized corporate worship, gathering together to worship God. Yes, I know you can watch it on your laptop, your iPad, your iPhone, but it is something special about gathering. Now, I do not um, dismiss the possibility of worshiping together, being an online experience and encounter, but if this is the place where God has called you to worship, I encourage you to also in interact with people online. Um, Talk to each other in the comments. Call each other on the phone while you're watching, work, watching worship. Make sure you stay engaged. This is not an individual sport, but worship is a corporate discipline. Even under highly dangerous circumstances, the early church knew this. They knew it, the importance of worshiping together, but they were urged not to forsake the assembling of themselves together. And to put some things in context, the, the epistle of Hebrews was written to a community of believers who were kicked out of their homes, taken out of their land um, because of worshiping God. And they knew the more people gathered together, the greater they were at risk of being caught for worshiping God. It was not like it is today where you could go to, come and go to church as you please, but they were risking their lives to worship. And the writer of Hebrews encouraged them, as risky as it is, as dangerous as it may be, do not forsake the assembling of saints. Likewise, child of God, I, I tell you, it is important, I would dare say imperative, that you come together any way, shape, or form you can to worship God. The epistles speak frequently of the believing community as the body of Christ, not the individuals of Christ. And as human life is unthinkable without head, arms, and legs, so it was unthinkable for those Christians to live in isolation from one another. Martin Luther, one of the great fathers of the Protestant Reformation, witnesses to the fact that at home in my own house, there's no warmth or vigor in me. But in the church, when the multitude is gathered together, a fire is kindled in my heart and it breaks its way through. In addition, when the people of God meet together, there often comes a sense of being gathered into one mind, being of one accord. Thomas Kelly writes, a quickening presence pervades us, breaking down some part of the special privacy and isolation of our individual lives and blending our spirits within a super individual life and power. An objective, dynamic presence enfolds us all, nourishes our souls, speaks glad, unutterable comfort with us, and quickens us in depths that had before been slumbering. When we are truly gathered into worship, things occur that could never occur alone. And there is the psychology of the group to be sure, and yet it is so much more. It is divine inter inter interpenetration. I'm sorry. There is what the biblical writers called Kononia, deep inward fellowship in the power of the spirit. This experience far transcends a spirit decor. It is not in the least dependent upon homogeneous units or even knowing information about one another's lives. There comes a divine melting of our separateness. In the power of the one spirit, we become wrapped in a sense of unity and of presence such as quiets all words and enfolds us within an unspeakable calm and interknittedness within a vaster life. Such fellowship and worship makes vicarious worship the, the media tasteless and flat. Genuine worship has only one leader, that's Jesus Christ.
And when I speak of Jesus as the leader of worship, I mean, first of all, that he is alive and present amongst his people. His voice can be heard in their hearts and his presence known, fully recognized. We not only read about him in scripture, we can know him by revelation. He wants to teach us, guide us, stretch us, challenge us, rebuke us, and comfort us. Christ is also alive and present in all his offices. In worship, we are prone to view Christ only in his priestly office as Savior and Redeemer. But he is also among us as our prophet and king. That is, he will teach us about righteousness and give us the power to do what is right. George Fox says, meet together in the name of Jesus. He is your prophet, your shepherd, your bishop, your priest in the midst of you to open to you and to sanctify you and to feed you with life and to quicken you with life. Further, Christ is alive and present in all his power. He saves us not only from the consequences of sin, but from the domination of sin. Whatever he teaches us, he will give us the power to obey. If Jesus is our leader, miracles should be expected to occur in worship. Signs, miracles, wonders, healings, both inward and outward will be the rule, not the exception. The book of Acts will not just be something we read about, but something we experience as well. Finally, Christ is the leader of worship in the sense that he alone decides what human means will be used, if any. Individuals preach or prophesy or sing or pray as they are called forth by Jesus Christ. Not because it's on the program, because, but because the leader said so. This way, there is no room for the elevation of private reputations. Jesus alone is honored. As our living head calls people forth, any or all of the gifts of the spirit can be freely exercised and gladly received. Perhaps a word of knowledge is given in which the intent of the heart is revealed, and we know that King Jesus is in charge. Perhaps there is a prophecy or an exhortation that puts on us on the edge of our seats because we sense that Kol Yahweh, the voice of God, has been spoken. Preaching or teaching that comes forth because the living head has called it forth, breathes life into worship. Preaching that is without divine unction falls like a frost on worship. Heart preaching inflames the spirit of worship. Head preaching smothers the glowing embers. There's nothing more quickening than spirit-inspired and spirit-led preaching. Nothing more deadening than human-inspired preaching. With all this lofty talk about Christ as the leader of worship, you might conclude that human leadership is unimportant. Nothing could be further from the truth. God does not raise up inspired leaders who can guide people into worship with authority and compassion, then the experience of worship will be nearly impossible. This is the reason for the leadership gifts of the spirit. Worship leaders who are called out by God must not be shy about their leadership. People need to be led into worship from the outer court to the inner court, and finally into the Holy of Holies. God anoints leaders to bring people through this progression into worship. So I know some of you may be saying, is this a contradiction? Is this confusing? I thought you said only Jesus Christ is the worship leader. Yes, that is what Richard J. Foster said in the beginning, but he is also saying that God can raise up vessels, willing vessels who are completely submitted to the spirit of God and what God wants to say to the people at that time, God can use those people to usher in the spirit in such a powerful way. And so the question is not about titles or positions, but rather who is willing to let God use them. Say, I want God to use me in a powerful way. I want to let go and let God, let God have his way. Amen. Now we'll look into avenues of worship or into worship. One reason worship should be considered spiritual discipline is because it is an ordered way of acting and living that sets us before God so that God can transform us. Although we are only responding to the liberating touch of the Holy Spirit, there are divinely appointed avenues into this realm. The first avenue into worship is to still all humanly initiated activity. The stilling of creaturely activity, as the patriarchs of the inner life called it, is not something to be confined to formal worship services, but is a lifestyle. It is to permeate the daily fa fabric of our lives. We are to live 
in a perpetual inward listening silence so that God is the source of our words and actions. If we are accustomed to carrying out the business of our lives in human strength and wisdom, we will do the same in gathered worship. If, however, we have cultivated the habit of allowing every conversation, every business transaction to be divinely prompted, that same sensitivity will flow into public worship. Francois Fenelon writes, happy the soul which by a sincere self-renunciation holds itself ceaselessly in the hands of its creator, ready to do everything which he wishes, which never stops saying to itself a hundred times a day, Lord, what wouldst thou that I should do? Does that sound impossible? The only reason we believe it to be far beyond us is that we do not understand Jesus as our present teacher. We have been under his tutelage for a time. We see how it is possible for every motion of our lives to have its root in God. We wake up in the morning and lie in bed quietly praising and worshiping the Lord. We tell him that we desire to live under his leadership and rule. Driving to work, we ask our teacher, how are we doing? Immediately, our mentor flashes before our mind that caustic remark we made to our spouse at breakfast, that shrug of disinterest we gave our children on the way out the door. We realize we have been living in the flesh. There is confession there, restoration, and a new humility. We stop at the gas station and sense a divine urging to get acquainted with the attendant, to see them as a person rather than an automation. We drive on rejoicing in our new insight into spirit-initiated activity. And so it goes throughout our day, a prompting here or a drawing there, sometimes a bolting ahead or a lagging behind our guide. Like a child taking first steps, we are learning through success and failure, confident that we have a present teacher who, through the Holy Spirit, will guide us into all truth. In this way, we come to understand what Paul means when he instructs us to walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, to still or calm the activity of the flesh so that the activity of the Holy Spirit dominates the way we live will affect and inform public worship. Sometimes it will take the form of absolute silence. That's what stilling is. Certainly it is more fitting to come in reverential silence and awe before the Holy One of eternity than to rush into his presence with hearts and minds askew and tongues full of words. The scriptural admonition is, the Lord is in his holy temple, let all of the earth keep silence before him. The desert father Amonis writes, behold my beloved, I have shown you the power of silence, how thoroughly it heals and how fully pleasing it is to God. It is by silence that the saints grew. It was because of silence that the power of God dwelt in them, because of silence that the mysteries of God were known to them. But not only is silence an avenue for the presence of God and to worship God, praise is another avenue into worship. The Psalms are the literature of worship and their most prominent feature is praise to heal. Praise the Lord is the shout that reverberates from one end of the Psalter to the other. Singing, shouting, dancing, rejoicing, adoring are all the language of praise. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Scripture urges us to offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. The old covenant required the sacrifice of bulls and goats. The new covenant requires the sacrifice of praise. Peter tells us that as Christ's new royal priesthood, we are to offer spiritual sacrifices, which means to declare the wonderful deeds of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter and John left the Sanhedrin with bleeding backs and praising lips. Paul and Silas filled the Philippian jail with their song of praise. In each case, they were offering the sacrifice of praise. The mightiest stirring of, of praise in the 20th century has been the charismatic movement. Throughout it, God, through it, God has breathed new life and vitality into millions of people. In our day, the Church of Jesus Christ is coming into a greater awareness of how central praise is in bringing us into worship. This is what we call spiritual renewal or renewal theology, where God is doing something amazing and wonderful in those who have gotten kind of flat, those who have gotten kind of dull. Do you need revival in your worship? Do you need renewal in your worship and livelihood? Right now is the right time. And this is the right place 
to begin focusing on praising God in such a way that God can use you for even greater works. In praise, we see how totally the emotions need to be brought into the act of worship. Worship that is solely cerebral is an aberration. Feelings are a legitimate part of the human personality and should be employed in worship. That's right. If you're sad, let that dictate how worship flows. If you are rejoicing, let that help. Let that be aided in worshiping and, and intensifying the move of God. That if people are joyful and rejoicing, let it be vibrant. Let the worship not be dull and sad and mon not monotone, but um, so low that, that people can't even feel it or they leave worse than how they came. Let the worship be impacted by the feelings. Now, I'm not saying worship should be an emotional sensationalism activity because there is such a thing as church services being so emotionally based rather than spirit based that they just feel good messages and music or uh, they cater to what they think people are feeling. But no, I'm saying let the worship match the mood of both the spirit and the people within the congregation. <clears throat> singing is meant to move us into praise. That's right, singing is a great part of worship. Singing provides a medium for the expression of emotion. Through music, we express our joy, our thanksgiving, our sadness, our hope, our peace. No less than 41 Psalms command us to sing unto the Lord. If singing can occur, in a concentrated manner, it serves to focus us. We become centered. Our fragmented minds and spirits flow into a unified whole. We become poised toward God. God calls for worship that involves our whole being. The body, mind, spirit, and emotion, emotions should all be laid on the altar of worship. Often we forget that worship should include the body as well as the mind and the spirit. The Bible describes worship in physical terms. The root meaning for the Hebrew word we translate worship is to prostrate. The word blessed literally means to kneel. Thanksgiving refers to an extension of the hand lifted up, raised towards God. Throughout scripture, we find a variety of physical postures in connection with worship. Lying prostrate, standing, kneeling, lifting the hands, clapping the hands, lifting the head, bowing the head, dancing, and wearing sackcloth and ashes. The point is that we are to offer God our bodies as well as all the rest of our being. Worship is appropriately physical. We are to present our bodies to God in a posture consistent with the inner spirit in worship. Standing, clapping, dancing, lifting the hands, lifting the head, our posture is consistent with the spirit of praise. To sit still looking dour and sour is simply not appropriate for praise. Kneeling, bowing the head, lying prostrate, or posture is consistent with the spirit of adoration and humility. We are quick to object to this line of teaching. People have different temperaments. We argue that that may appeal to emotional types, but I'm naturally quiet and reserved. It isn't the kind of worship that will meet my need. What we must see is the real question in worship is not what will meet my need. The real question is, what kind of worship does God call for? It is clear that God calls for wholehearted worship, and it is, a reason, it is reasonable to expect wholehearted worship to be physical as to expect it to be cerebral and emotional. Often our reserved temperament is little more than fear of what others will think of us. What happens if I hit the wrong note? What happens if I look funny dancing? Don't worry about people. Let me deliver you and help liberate you here right now. Don't worry about other people in worship because it's not about them. It's all about God. Having said this, I must hasten to add that the physical response to worship is never to be ma manipulated in any way. And that's not my words, it's Richard J. Foster. And I agree. We are to give each other freedom to respond to the move, moving of God upon the heart. In many worship experiences that both Richard J. Foster and I have seen, at any given moment, people sitting, standing, kneeling, and lying prostrate, and the Spirit of God resting upon them all. Um, I've been in worship services. Some people are screaming. Some people are just weeping. All of this is worship of God. And if you're a worship leader or you give 
are given the position of worship leader, how dare you uh, chastise one for not doing what you exactly want them to do. You don't know what God is doing in that moment. Be open to God moving in various ways and stop putting God in a box that everybody has to run around. Everyone has to be loud. That may not be what God is telling a person to do, but you just trust the spirit of God in the house on that day. Some evidence, deep emotion, and others show no outward manifestations whatsoever, but all can be under the brooding spirit of God. For freedom, Christ has set us free and stand fast. Therefore, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. That means stop putting God in a box and limiting your worship to what you've seen, but know that God can do some amazing things that you haven't even experienced yet. Next, Richard J. Foster moves into steps into worship. He says, worship is something we do. Studying the theology of worship and debating the forms of worship are all good. By themselves, they are inadequate. In the final analysis, we learn to worship by worshiping. Let me give a few simple steps that I hope will help in the experience of worship. And I'm sure this is what some of you came here for. Um, so first, learn to practice the presence of God daily. Really try to follow Paul's words, pray without ceasing. Punctuate every moment with inward whisperings of adoration, praise, and thanksgiving. Have personal times of inner worship, whether it's at home, or if you have a quiet space just outside your home, or a place where you will not be disturbed, I encourage you to go there as much as possible. And as you have personal times of inner worship and confession and Bible study and attentiveness to Christ, this will heighten your expectancy in public worship because the gathered experience of worship just becomes a continuation and an intensification of what you've been doing all week long. When a person has intense worship during the week, Sunday mornings are no problem. That's number one. Secondly, have many different experiences of worship. Worship God when you are alone. Have home groups, not just for Bible study, but for the very experience of worship itself. Gather small groups of two, three, maybe a few more. And learn to offer up a sacrifice of praise. Many things can happen in small gatherings that just by sheer size typically would not happen in the larger experience. All of these little experiences of worship will empower and impact the larger Sunday gatherings. That's right. I would love the notion of small groups in various pockets, um, whether they be in Sussex, Prince George, uh, Petersburg, Hopewell. We can have small groups focused solely on worship, focused solely on Bible study, various aspects of the spiritual disciplines, and it can be so powerful. And by the time you get to church on Sunday, you, you've been, as they say, churching all week long. And you are ready for worship because you've been doing it every day. Third, find ways to really prepare for the gathered experience of worship. Prepare maybe on Saturday night by going to bed early, by having an inward experience of examination and confession. Ask God to forgive you for any wrong that you may have done that week. By going over the hymns and scripture passages that, if, that you know will be used on Sunday. Um, and if you ever want to know what the sermons will be, reach out to me by Tuesday or Wednesday like today, I, I'll have it, and I um, I don't mind sharing it, I, and if you want, I can start um, sharing the upcoming scripture uh, on our uh, Facebook page, <clears throat> and maybe even create a quick video on YouTube. Uh, I want us to be so engaged with the word and the worship, uh, and that's why I do series, so that you can kind of have an idea of what's going to be preached on and what, uh, sung on, in the following week. So, for example, this Sunday, will be in, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and 15 through 17. So go ahead and look at it. That way you'll have an idea what the, the worship uh, will be about and what the word will be about, and then we can go from there. All right, I don't want to go too far off tangent. Uh, <clears throat> by going over the hymns in scripture, uh, you can get, get an early sense of, of the tone of worship and, and, uh, and the mood and the flow. Uh, that all can be great indicators. <clears throat> Fourth, have a willingness to be gathered in the power of the Lord. That is, as an individual, you must learn to let go of your agenda, your concern, and so many other things, worrying about whether or not you'll be blessed, whether, worrying about whether or not you'll enjoy the song, uh, worrying about the word, and just yield to God. Yield to the experience of the gathered fellowship. 
The language of the gathered fellowship is not I, but we. There is a submission to the ways of God. There is a submission to one another in the Christian fellowship. There's a desire for God's life to rise up in the group, not just within the individual. If you are praying for a manifestation of the spiritual gifts, it does not have to come upon you, but can come upon anybody else and upon the entire group as a whole, if that pleases God. Be of one mind and of one accord. Number five, cultivate holy dependency. Holy dependency means that you are utterly and completely dependent upon God for anything significant to happen. And if you're coming expecting something in worship, you should come expecting on God to do something and that you don't expect it to have to be based off of your words or a certain pe person singing or reading or preaching, but that God will move on that day. There is inward travail that the evil will weaken, and that the good will rise up. You look forward to God acting and moving and teaching and wooing and winning. And the work is God's, not yours. Number six, as far as leading into worship, absorb distractions with gratitude. If there's no noise or distraction, rather than fussing and fuming about it, learn to take it in and conquer it. I'm sorry, if there is noise, not if there's no noise, but if there's some noises or distraction, don't fuss about it, don't even bring attention to it too much, learn to take it in and conquer it. If little children are running about, bless them. Thank God that they're alive and that they have energy. Come willing to relax with distractions. There may be a message from the Lord. When I am preaching, I love to have babies and little children in the congregation because sometimes they're the only ones that I can be sure are alive. That's what Richard J. Foster says. He loves having babies and children in, in the service. I love them too. Um, and <clears throat> I've had scenarios where I've been preaching and someone, it appeared to be, they were being led by the other spirit. And it is very important to just keep worship. worship. I know of one time, and I'll say this is a lack of, of maturity on my part. I noticed a lot of people looking and in the midst of the sermon, I said, let's just focus on God and not worry about them. Well, in that moment, I was obviously focusing on that. And, and afterwards, although people said they enjoyed the sermon afterwards, I, I felt like that was irresponsible of me because that also dismissed a person. So I encourage you, if you're ever in a moment of that, whether it's a spirit that appears not of God. Now, if God is telling you to address that spirit, of course, do so. But if God is telling you, hey, just keep going, keep singing, keep preaching, keep teaching, I'll handle that. Don't even bring attention to it. If it's a baby, this is that's a, in, an extreme. But now if it's just baby, hey, be glad that they're in the sanctuary. They could be at home watching Cocoa Melon or something, but they're in the service with you. So embrace certain things. Um, don't get so caught up in something else because you can enhance the distraction. All right, number seven, learn to offer a sacrifice of worship. Many times you will not feel like worship. Perhaps you've had so many disappointing experiences in the past that you think it is hardly worth it. There is such a low sense of the power of God and few people are adequately prepared for Sunday worship. But you need to go anyhow. You need to move anyway. You need to offer a sacrifice of worship. You need to be with people of God and say, these are my people. As stiff-necked and hard-hearted and sinful as we may be, together we come to God. Many times I do not feel like worshiping, and I have to kneel down and say, Lord, I don't feel like worshiping, but I desire to give you this time. It belongs to you. I will waste this time for you. I will sacrifice my time for you. Isaac Pennington says that when people are gathered for genuine worship, they're like a heap of fresh and burning coals, warming one another as a great strength and freshness and vigor of life flows into all. That's right. When you're connected to true worshipers who come excited for worship, you all feed off each other's energy. So I will encourage you, one, get connected with other people in your weekly and daily routines of, of enhancing your worship life and your prayer life and your praise life, but also... Be careful who you sit beside. It's not by accident the preachers will tell you to turn to your neighbor and make sure you're on a certain row. Uh, while we love and embrace all people, but it's just something different when you're connected to other worshipers and you're sitting next to people. That energy can be contagious. So if you can, sit next to some people who come in ready and fired up for God. When it comes to worship, go even if you don't feel like it. Go even if worship has been discouraging 
uh, before, if it's been dry before, go praying, go expecting God to move, go looking for God to do a new and living work among you. Be excited about God doing something, anticipate God doing something, and then experience the fruit of worship. Just as worship begins in holy expectancy, it ends in holy obedience. If worship does not propel us into a greater obedience, it has not been worship. To stand before the Holy One of eternity is to change. Resentments cannot be held with the same tenacity when we enter his gracious light. As Jesus says, we need to leave our gift at the altar and go set the matter straight. In worship, an increased power steals its way into the heart sanctuary. An increased compassion grows into the soul. To worship is to change. Holy obedience saves worship from becoming an opiate and escape from the pressing needs of modern life. Worship enables us to hear the call to service clearly so that we respond. Now, remember, service is not a substitute for worship. And although service is an end goal, it does not mean that we skip worship. Worship should propel us to a place where we can say to the Lord, here I am, send me. Authentic worship will impel and compel us to join the Lamb's war against dem demonic powers everywhere, on the personal level, on the social level, and on the institutional level. Jesus, the Lamb of God, is our commander-in-chief, and we receive his orders for service and go, conquering and to conquer with the word of truth, returning love for hatred, wrestling with God against the enmity with prayers and tears night and day, with fasting, mourning and lamentation in patience, in faithfulness, in truth, in love unfeigned, in long suffering, and in all the fruits of the spirit, that if by any means we may overcome evil with good in all things and in all ways, we do exactly what Christ says, because we have a holy obedience that has been cultivated over years of experience. Willard Sperry declares worship is a deliberate and disciplined adventure in reality. It is not for the timid or comfortable it involves an opening of ourselves to the adventurous life of the spirit. It makes all the religious paraphernalia of temples and priests and rites and ceremonies irrelevant. It involves a willingness to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly as we teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And as we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, we are to do it with thankfulness in our hearts to God. And we worship because we're thankful. We're grateful because God has done great things. Thank you for joining us. I love you with the love of Christ. We'll be back next week uh, with another spiritual discipline. And until then, have a great week. See you on Sunday. God bless. Oh, and remember, Jesus is bigger than Sunday. So worship the Lord every day.